Dear friends, uh, good morning on the East Coast. Good evening in Korea. We are hosting a uh, very special guest today. To those of us who observe Holy Week, um, this is also a very special day, uh, Holy Thursday, and we thought this would be the, the best way to spend a very meaningful hour with um, my very good friend and our very good friend, Tim Peters. Uh, let me welcome um, our board members and dear friends who are joining us this morning. Um, Colonel David Maxwell, Professor David Maxwell, HRNK board member is joining, uh, KDO, uh, Dr. KDO is here, and so um, many other good and dear friends of HRNK. Our speaker this morning, Tim Peters, has continued to inspire all of us through his uh, dedication and sacrifice. And by that, those of us who know it are fully aware of the sacrifices he and his family have made to come to the rescue of um, our brothers and sisters in North Korea. Uh, Tim uh, hails from uh, Michigan State University. His, um, his work uh, around the world, his missionary and humanitarian work spans several decades. Um, he uh, began uh, his uh, work in Korea in the 70s and 80s. He uh, is well known as the founder of Helping Hands Korea Catacombs. Uh, this is an NGO that has found very effective and creative ways of aiding uh, North Koreans. Um, Tim was deeply involved with rescues of North Koreans along the Underground Railroad. He featured very prominently in Melanie Kirkpatrick's book, Escape from North Korea, The Untold Story of Asia's Underground Railroad, uh, known for his knowledge, for his dedication, for his uh, work of many decades uh, on these very important issues. Tim has been invited multiple times to testify before the US Congress. Uh, Tim was um, on the cover of Time Magazine. I was going to show the cover, but knowing that he's such a humble and modest man, I didn't want to put him in a tight spot. Um, he was profiled in an, um, a, a major article in the Time Magazine in 2006 a uh, an article entitled um, The Long Walk to Freedom. Uh, he is the recipient of multiple prizes, prizes including St. Stephen's Prize in Oslo, and that was uh, presented by Norway's former prime minister, Kiel Bondovic. Um, Tim never tires, Tim never rests. He continues to be the same champion of uh, freedom for all not only Christians, but uh, freedom and justice for all. He uh, continues to seek creative and effective ways to aid the oppressed people of North Korea. And this is what today's event is about. Once we're done with uh, Tim's main presentation, I'd like to remind our distinguished participants that uh, you may ask questions through the chat function and also through the Q&A function. Today's event is on the record, Tim and I, and uh, all of us have nothing to hide. So Tim, that said, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for agreeing to spend this meaningful hour with us this morning. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Uh, I appreciate your very gracious introduction and I thank uh, the board as well uh, for inviting me to, to share this chat. And uh, if I may, I'd, I'd like to really uh, send a shout out to my dear friend, Chuck Downs, a real pioneer of HRNK who introduced uh, me to the good work that AR, HRNK uh, was doing and is doing. And uh, I, I believe that uh, Chuck was gonna try to tune in uh, sometime during the meeting, but I, I just want to salute him for this pioneering work that he did uh, in the early stages of HRNK. Well, I, uh, I feel a little bit as if I'm kind of walking a tightrope here because the, the title of the, uh, the title is uh, Silent Partners uh, Helping Persecuted North Koreans. So 
as soon as I open my mouth, I'm kind of violating being, being uh, silent in a sense. So uh, in that respect, I feel a little bit like walking a tightrope. I, I want to continue to raise awareness about what uh, has been done and what can be done. Uh, and uh, at the same time, try to protect the extremely important and sensitive uh, partners that we have in various uh, in various locations. So I will try my best. Um, I think what I'd like to start to do, Greg, is is to make a definition of sorts about persecuted Christians uh, in North Korea, or let's just say the North Korean Church. Uh, I think there is perhaps a, a kind of prevailing view that, okay, there is a one single unitary group of, of people, of uh, North Koreans, uh, who are huddled down and, uh, you know, hunkering down in, in a persecuted position. And certainly that is true for a good number of them. But I do think we should also mention, uh, as uh, David Hawk brought out in his excellent study, uh, about the fact that there is the, uh, what I call the Potemkin churches in, in North Korea, uh, in, in Pyongyang, uh, <clears throat> which in many ways serve to, uh, serve to kind of project an image of, uh, freedom of religion, et cetera. Uh, you will not be surprised that I am not very impressed at all by, by these uh, particular institutions. Nevertheless, they do exist. And I've known some South Korean pastors who've actually gone and uh, shared a sermon there. And he did say that there are some people who are descendants of Christians who go back to the early 20th century. So I think that, uh, you know, it's only fair to mention them. Uh, the COI also mentions roughly 500 uh, so-called house churches. But if they're registered with the government, um, I think we have every reason to question uh, where their supreme and primary loyalty goes. Nevertheless, uh, it seems as if there are some uh, gatherings like that. Um, the third definition I would say would be that one describing people who are ex exercising their Christian faith, whether they've inherited it from their grandparents or their parents, or perhaps they've converted uh, in, the, you know, just within their, within their uh, lifetime, in their adult life, but they are absolutely uh, hunted down by the North Korean regime and uh, security apparatus. And uh, we all know that uh, the consequences of uh, reading the Bible, holding a meeting, whether it's in a back room of your house, in a barn or in the forest or wherever it might be, uh, the consequences are extremely dire for them. Okay, uh, but I'd like to describe yet another facet, which I believe in many ways is, is not mentioned nearly often enough. And that is the fact that over a period of almost a quarter of a century now, as we all know, there have been many North Koreans as escapees who have traveled into China. And uh, many of them, uh, I would even say almost the majority of them have in one way or another come in contact with individuals who have helped them uh, to find shelter, help them to uh, be fed, help them to get logistical support to go other places that they want to go, and sometimes even helping them to leave China altogether. Uh, in many ways, I think that these, uh, this, uh, there are many conversions or uh, individuals on the pathway of being deeply persuaded and impressed by the Christian faith because they have come in contact with sincere uh, believers in China in the escapee's time of great need. And uh, I call this the uh, emigre church 
or the Refugee Church, which I believe is an absolutely important and integral part of the North Korean church. But very, very often, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it is, there seems to be a concept that North Korean Christians are only those who are within the geographic borders of North Korea. And I think that may be overly simplistic. So I would like to simply uh, make that distinction and maybe uh, introduce the idea that there are other facets to this diamond, so to speak. Given, given what I've just said, uh, I would like to say first that <clears throat> part of our work has to do with providing uh, food and humanitarian relief goods to uh, those Christians who are in fact inside the DPRK. And they are hiding, they are you know, under pressure, and many of them are persecuted. Often they're dragged into prisons and, and, and detention centers of, of various descriptions. Um, as, as we all know, the Christians uh, have been uh, downgraded uh, in Songbun, uh, as Bob Collins brings out so uh, vividly in, in his uh, HRNK reports, uh, by the Christians are being sent to the outer fringes, the, the frontier of North Korea. Uh, so uh, that would mean, obviously, uh, areas like uh, North Hamgyong province, uh, even South Hamgyong province, but Yanggangdo, Jagangdo, North Pyongan province, etc. The provinces that quite conveniently, in fact, uh, border China. And uh, naturally, this, uh, this geographical fact is uh, quite, in a way, ironically helpful to external partners who are trying to, in some ways, logistically assist the North Korean brothers and sisters by uh, coordinating uh, delivery of, uh, frankly, uh, uh, medicine, uh, food, and uh, quite often in recent years because of frequent uh, typhoons, uh, it's been necessary to bring uh, aid in, in the terms of uh, clothing and blankets and uh, even uh, materials like tarpaulins and things like that, that uh, are possible to help when, uh, uh, when in, in, in uh, many North Korean homes have uh, collapsed in these uh, typhoon uh, uh, storms. So uh, that is a big part of what we've been fortunately been able to do. But what I'd like to really stress is that uh, at least in our case, and I can only speak uh, on behalf of our NGO, uh, it frankly took me 14 years to find what I uh, was quite certain was an authentic, capable, and quiet partner or several partners in order to actually carry out uh, such a sensitive uh, activity as this. Uh, there was no shortage of individuals and organizations who said that they were doing uh, such and so to help the North Korean Christians. However, over time, it became clear that uh, certain priorities regarding uh, public attention and kind of marketing uh, strategies, etc., uh, in the public sphere, sphere uh, made it quite clear that probably th these folks uh, were not uh, in, in the category of being able to do the extraordinarily sensitive job of, of being a kind of middle person or middle, uh, you know, link in the chain. So uh, I don't think I've ever had any test of patience longer than that in my entire life of in the meantime, we were busy helping refugees escape. We were helping with orphans along the border, et cetera, uh, regardless of who, who they were, regardless of what they believed, et cetera. And we still strongly believe in, in, that, uh, in that particular ethical standpoint about how we prioritize our help. 
But as a Christian, uh, naturally, I did feel a very soft spark, spot in my heart to want to also help persecuted Christians, given the fact that, in, in fact, uh, as I, I guess mentioned in the introduction, I mean, the, the world watch list of uh, Open Doors, a highly respected monitoring and surveillance uh, program uh, to, to look at Christian persecution around uh, the world has designated North Korea for 21 years in a row as being the worst state sponsor of persecution of Christians. So uh, naturally, uh, I, uh, I was interested and we are interested to be able to try to bring some type of relief to these North Korean believers. Um, it hasn't been easy. Uh, mainly this for uh, on our part is mainly involved in fundraising uh, and uh, going out in various places and doing our best to raise the necessary resources to purchase medicine, uh, to purchase uh, other relief goods. And so uh, our main focus then is basically those outlying provinces uh, and in a way, those outlying provinces really give an idea of the historical context of the North Korean church going all the way back to the 1950s. Again, uh, mentioning that uh, they were banished in many cases. Uh, obviously, North Hamgyong province, for example, has been referred to frequently and also uh, in many publications, including the Commission of Inquiry report as the Siberia of uh, North Korea. And I think it fits that description because in fact, so many Christians all the way back to the late forties, all the way through have been banished to North Hamgyong province. So uh, that is uh, uh, one aspect of what we do. Uh, a second aspect is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, assisting North Koreans who have crossed over into China uh, and many of whom do, did not have a Christian background, at least that they knew of. And I add that, that they knew of because there are actually many cases where uh, parents do not reveal to their children that they in fact hold the Christian faith or maybe their grandparents did because uh, often in school, uh, the teachers are quite well trained to ask certain questions to find out what kinds of books are being read at home and things like that. And children end up inadvertently reporting on their parents regarding whether or not they're Christians. So that naturally presents a bit of a dilemma to, uh, to some parents. They want to convey and trans, uh, transmit their faith uh, or introduce it to their children, but they also know that they are running some risk that the children may accidentally and completely inadvertently reveal uh, what their family uh, believes and thereby disrupting the entire family and with the worst possible consequence in some cases of being sent off to a prison camp as a family and even up to three generations. I remember if I can just bring one example to mind, uh, one uh, absolutely delightful lady, uh, an escapee whose husband uh, was a Christian and he was involved in transporting Bibles uh, from China in, back into North Korea. He was caught, imprisoned, and uh, the, the wife uh, was in fact a believer. But actually the, the fact of the matter was that neither of them knew before they were married that their, both of their families were Christian. And it was only after that they were married that they began to, of course, open up more about their backgrounds and they discovered. So that uh, I wouldn't say is true in every case, but it is not terribly unusual that uh, this difficulty that uh, some North Korean families, particular adults and parents 
have of sh sharing, deciding whether or not to reveal that to their, to their children. In any case, uh, a number of people in, uh, have out of desperation, economic hardship, uh, quest for a better life, etc. cetera, uh, as we all know, have traveled into China. And um, many of uh, these individuals who never have heard anything except North Korean propaganda about uh, the Christians are, uh, are bad and missionaries are wolves and you know that this is the opiate of the people and et cetera, et cetera. It's a political crime to believe it. Uh, there, in fact, the North Korean escapees are truly uh, often very open to hear the news of, of the New Testament. And I think the fact that they are met not only with a sermon, but they're met with some kind of demonstration of what kind of help do you need? Uh, is it shelter? Is it food? Is it clothing? Is it you know, someone to drive you from here to there. I think that combination of uh, witness, if you want to call it that, is actually very compelling to the North Koreans as they're coming out in desperation, completely uncertain of what, where they're going to go and what they're going to do in China. And uh, I believe it's planting a seed. I, 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 I'm not naive to think that m most or all of the escapees who are coming in contact with Christian workers in, in China are gonna automatically and quickly become uh, a hard and fast believer. But I do believe that it is planting a seed and a very important seed that may take time to germinate and uh, often does over a period of months and even, and even years. Um, I would say that uh, if I may, something that has been most unexpected, and this has occurred uh, during the pandemic year, especially, uh, completely and utterly unexpected, uh, is the fact that many North Koreans uh, who had traveled in previous years and had managed to set up some living situation in China, whether it be in a, in a rural area on a farm or at a restaurant or as a caregiver in someone's home, et cetera, working in a restaurant. Uh, the pandemic posed a tremendous unexpected emergency for them. They were already living on the edge, so to speak, but with the Chinese uh, health inspectors making random checks in urban situations, on street corners, in farms, etc., cetera. Uh, suddenly individuals uh, who had traveled uh, from North Korea and were living in, uh, in China with some degree of uh, safety or security, or they, so they thought, were completely uh, dis, uh, dismayed to discover that in fact, at any given time, a health inspector, who of course is a government officer, could, could come and learn that they can't speak Chinese, et cetera. So we were flooded, frankly. Our NGO was flooded with uh, cries for help uh, and distress signals at a time where, frankly speaking, many NGOs were withdrawing and saying that they couldn't operate in that space. Um, I won't go into those details, but. I simply mention it because it compounded and added to the number of distress signals that kind of came our way. Uh, one of the most astonishing things, uh, we had occasionally come across disabled uh, escapees before, uh, but it was quite rare because naturally they're physically limited to be able to cross. But it turns out, uh, at least in our experience in the last uh, six to eight months, that in fact, there are more disabled North Koreans in, in China than I had ever dreamed. And uh, sometimes uh, it is parents, a single parent or a, a, even a grandparent who has brought a child or grandchild out of North Korea and uh, 
has uh, partly because uh, maybe the adult uh, the adult, uh, let's say it's a grandmother, it, let's say the adult son, who's the father of the child, uh, maybe there's a divorce in the family of his, uh, of his wife. Anyway, the, the grandparent ends up having the care of, of the disabled child. They discover that they are unable to support and provide for them uh, as a senior, and they've and plus the discrimination that the disabled child has, has experienced uh, causes them to kind of make a rather dramatic decision of crossing over. Now, these decisions were made, many of them, a couple of years ago before the pandemic took place. And they were working in places like farms and, and things like that. And suddenly they have asked for help. And I must say that one of the most rewarding experiences of my personal life and my work as a Christian activist has been uh, uh, the, the opportunity to try to help these uh, guardians and uh, disabled folks. Some of the disabled individuals are adults. Uh, they, they give a report saying that they have uh, often been separated at a very early age from their parents and sent to an orphanage. And they have never seen their parents after that, which coincides with uh, what, what the COI indicated uh, a number of witnesses said uh, back in 2014. So I found that to be very confirmatory of uh, that, particular, uh, that particular aspect of discrimination that occurs inside North Korea. So to be able to kind of help that very small vulnerable group uh, is uh, been extremely rewarding. And uh, yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, there's a group traveling at this, at this moment who some of whom uh, are disabled. So uh, I, uh, and naturally, the uh, guardians of the children, for example, or even those who are adults who are disabled, some on crutches, some have been polio victims from childhood, and yet they have uh, managed to somehow eke out a survival in, in China. But uh, these are, uh, as, as I recall what the Bible says, that we, we are mandated to care for the widows and the orphans, and uh, certainly, uh, in this case, for the disabled as well. And so uh, it is very heartening and encouraging that we do have this opportunity to do that. So um, once again, this kind of, in a way, touches base uh, very lightly and superficially on uh, various aspects of helping the persecuted Christians. Now, it doesn't begin to address some other projects that have to do with helping orphans of uh, North Korean human traffic victims in China who've been separated from their mothers uh, and in a sense have become orphaned through the mother's forced repatriation. But uh, uh, that is perhaps a topic for an, another day. Uh, but uh, that is ongoing as well. And quite honestly, many of those uh, uh, children uh, who are of mixed parentage of Chinese uh, North Korean parentage uh, have responded uh, very warmly uh, to to the good news of the New Testament as well. So, uh, I'm I guess I'm uh, describing uh, other uh, aspects as well. But I think my time is pretty much close to up. Am I right, Greg? <laughs> uh, yes, Tim. Indeed. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that opportunity. And I hope at least that overview uh, gives uh, some of our, the participants uh, an idea that uh, maybe things are a little bit more nuanced and uh, has, have very, uh, various facets that uh, cause them uh, food for thought. Well, Tim, thank you so much for the very comprehensive overview uh, we do have quite a few questions, and um, with your permission, let me begin with a question from the moderator. Tim, what does the Kim regime fear more? 
Is it the underground church as a space where ideas can be shared freely? Uh, or is it the, the underground church and Christianity as a set of religious beliefs that challenges the regime's own mythology? Or is it both? Well, I, it's an excellent question, Greg, and I do think it's both. Uh, I do think it's both, but I, I tend to feel that maybe the second point is uh, weighs a little bit heavier in, in the balance as to what it, the worries that it may cause the regime, the Kim family. Uh, the gospel message uh, seems to, to be a very potent challenge, obviously, to the Juche ideology, uh, which is essentially, of course, the creed uh, of, of the official DPRK, uh, uh, you know, the state. Uh, but if I may, I would even like to add a third point, uh, and that is that and this is, I think, brought out clearly in the, uh, the COI as well, that the underground church provides a platform for social and political organization and interaction outside the state realm. Now, of course, in a way that partly uh, addresses your issue of this, you know, a space, but I also think that it includes the potential platform for political organization and even uh, that network that is highly refined and well oiled uh, throughout the country without getting into too many details. Uh, the, I believe that the regime is fearful that if given opportunity, that well-connected network could very well uh, morph into something beyond uh, a Christian, uh, just Christian community for worship and things like that. And I, I can't help but think that the Kim family is of course very aware of the fact that Angela Merkel, the chancellor of Germany is the daughter of an East German pastor who was very much involved in the resistance movement against the, uh, against the uh, communist regime in East Germany. They're very aware of who her father was and can probably see that that would uh, possibly, uh, you know, once the fire and the wick is lit in North Korea could go that way as well. And uh, you and I were talking earlier uh, about uh, the Hungarian pastor in your own birthplace, uh, Laszlo Tokish, who refused to be evicted from his uh, home in, in Romania during the Nicolae Ceausescu regime and helped to mobilize protests that eventually brought about that collapse. So uh, I, I do remember uh, actually uh, the emergency surgeon, uh, Dr. Bollertsen, who was a couple of years in giving sacrificial service in, in North Korea many years ago. And he would often mention that his minder would frequently bring up the uh, Romanian situation, and they would really want to know what was it that caused Ceausescu to fall. And uh, uh, it's, so it, it seems to me that's a reflection of, of, of what they're concerned about. So I would say that uh, that's a long answer to a short question, but I hope that, uh, I think there is a third aspect too, that they see that it, it is a, a potential uh, platform to do more than just talk about ideas. Thank you, Tim. And of course, Romania and North Korea, the Romanian president, a topic for a future program. Uh, let me go to Bob Collins in Korea next. Uh, Bob is asking, what are the North Korean security services doing to suppress Christianity in North Korea and among North Koreans in Manchuria? Back to you, Tim. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I would say that uh, inside North Korea, and, and Bob, I'm guessing, would know more about inside North Korea, how the state, uh, uh, the Boebu is doing. But I, certainly they're uh, extremely sophisticated in monitoring um, 
the activities of uh, suspected Christians uh, with all types of surveillance and uh, using all the methods at their disposal to try to uh, discover who might be involved in uh, uh, transmitting or you know, uh, working together with other Christians, et cetera. So I think that much of uh, a good deal of surveillance uh, time and investment is spent in monitoring people, particularly watching families of people who have left and seeing uh, what possible in uh, post-departure impact that may have on their families uh, through communication by Chinese telephones and things like that. On escapees, uh, I would say that uh, the North Korean uh, security services, especially the Boibu, uh, are active, very active in China. Uh, they, you know, interdict or they go into uh, into the flow of the refugees themselves, oftentimes uh, masquerading as refugees in order to find out uh, where the nodes of uh, assistance might be and uh, uh, et cetera. And working together with Chinese uh, security apparatus in order to interdict uh, rescue operations and things like that. I have to say that I had one very, very uh, discomforting um, and uh, rather, uh, bizarre situation where I came in contact uh, being introduced to a North Korean agent who was masquerading as a Christian aid worker in China. And he had a full identity, he had a, a full profile, and it was actually, he was introduced to us by a South Korean missionary who was fully uh, convinced that this was a genuine North Korean who had you know, made a conversion and they were as a, uh, as a refugee, et cetera. And it was only when I brought this individual's picture to someone who was uh, quite long in, in the work uh, that we're related to, and he immediately recognized him and said, this is, uh, this is somebody who's undercover. We know who he is. And uh, so it's not beyond, um, imagination that some of the Aboibu are actually even masquerading as Christian workers in China as well. So it's, uh, it, it can be a pretty dangerous uh, situation. Thank you, Tim. I'm uh, going to go to Colonel David Maxwell, board member next. He wishes to thank you and your family for doing the Lord's work. Uh, Dave has two questions. First, for those of us who are not able to attend this meeting today, what message would you like us to transmit to them, to those who are not in attendance? Second, what is one action that you would like all of us as concerned human beings to take in order to support this very important mission and to help the Korean people living in the North who are suffering so horrendously? Well, thanks. Uh, thanks to Colonel Maxwell for his many years of encouragement to us personally and uh, for the excellent work that he's doing through, uh, through uh, teaching, but also through his informal institute of uh, strategic planners, etc., which I have benefited from greatly myself. I, I think I would uh, encourage uh, those of you who uh, you know, have contact with others that haven't been able to uh, come to the meeting is to um, not make the mistake. This is a, something that uh, I feel uh, has occurred often. Uh, and that is since the COVID-19 pandemic has sealed the border more or less between China and North Korea, there is uh, among some the idea that, okay, the, that part is over. In other words, escapees uh, are dwindling down to nothing, so there's nothing more to do. But I, I guess I would like to 
encourage uh, individuals to keep in mind that there is a residual amount and number of North Koreans who've somehow managed, as I've given examples about the disabled and their guardians, et cetera, who have hunkered down somewhere in China and managed to eke out some type of survival, et cetera. There, you know, we're, we've had 25 years of North Koreans crossing borders and not all of them have gone on or, <clears throat> you know, uh, traveled to South Korea, et cetera. So I would say um, don't uh, perhaps draw the conclusion that, well, there's nothing more to be done in order to help the North Koreans that are escaping, because in fact, there are many who have been there for a couple of years and now are finding themselves desperate to want to leave. And uh, that is one aspect. And uh, at the same time, I would say that the human rights situation inside North Korea is only getting worse from, from every indication that we have uh, seen that uh, the situation is, is not uh, improving. So I, I would encourage everyone to speak out, speak out to, to uh, members of Congress, to senators, to, to whoever will listen. Uh, and then uh, I would say in order to, uh, what can be done? I mean, obviously if individuals uh, want to drop everything they're doing and come to this part of the world and help, I, I but I uh, that uh, that is probably a bit impractical for most people. But uh, uh, we uh, naturally uh, helping organizations in some way, shape, or form, uh, volunteering, sending seeds is one thing that we do too, sending donations, whatever, those things really do translate into lives that are touched, people that are fed, people who get medicine, and people who get uh, moved uh, and evacuated out of China into other countries to safety. So um, that uh, hopefully those are some options that might be helpful. Tim, thank you. Melanie Kirkpatrick wishes to thank you for your many years of selfless work and service, helping some of the world's least fortunate people. Here is Melanie's question. For more than 10 years now, various organizations have endeavored to send information into North Korea, including Bibles, information about the Kim regime, South Korea. So in your view, how has this blast of information impacted North Koreans' attitudes toward their own regime? That's an excellent question. And uh, I just want to thank Melanie once more for so graciously including uh, so much of our work in her wonderful book. And I really do appreciate that so very much. Uh, I, I, I must say, uh, Greg, that I, I can't, I don't really know to what degree, because it's a little bit hard for us to have our finger on the pulse of that. Uh, it, in a way, I would say certainly, without question, the fact that, you know, whether it's Bibles or whether it's uh, thumb, thumb drives that are being brought, brought in, or if it's, uh, you know, the uh, South Korean movies or South Korean soap operas, etc. Definitely, definitely those, uh, those items over time have definitely penetrated into uh, basically all levels of, of, South, of North Korean society. And it can't help but have uh, a deep effect, largely because the regime is now re-emphasizing re that the penalties are going to be quite severe uh, for even more severe if people are discovered uh, watching South Korean movies, etc. So uh, I, you know, I, I'm sure there are other experts that perhaps, and certainly uh, North Koreans themselves who have left, that probably could answer that better. But I would say certainly that uh, the idea that North Korea is now hermetically, still hermetically sealed, I don't believe that 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 is true. 
Uh, and, and of course, there are uh, thousands upon thousands and tens of thousands of, for, of North Korean workers who have gone abroad and have uh, worked in many countries. Uh, so they're coming back and they're full of information and they're full of impressions of the outside world too. So I think that is also adding to the sum total of, of opening at least the awareness of North Koreans that uh, just how badly they're being treated. Tim, thank you very much. Michael Martin has had his hand up and has been very patiently waiting. Sir, we'll go to you next. Could you please uh, unmute your microphone? Tim, so we, uh, we do have quite a few questions. I hope you will not mind terribly if we go into overtime for just a few minutes. I don't do this usually, but... Uh... That'll be perfectly fine, perfectly fine. Okay. I'll try to keep my answers a little shorter. Terrific. So, uh, Mr. Martin, could you please unmute your microphone? Uh, right. Well, we will give you a little bit of time to do <clears> that. <throat> okay, we're ready. Thank you. Please go ahead. We still have no sound. Okay, while we're trying to figure it out, let me go to Dr. Okong Dun, Dr. Katie Haysig, who's also had her hand up. Katie, on to you, please. Hi, hi, Tim. You look very good. You have an angelic face because you are doing angelic work. <laughs> You're too kind, Katie. Thank yeah, you. You, are, you really look good. I mean, the, your 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 face just uh, emanates the good good uh, intention and the loving heart. Anyway, I have uh, two simple questions. Where are you now in Korea? Yes, yes, in Seoul. Okay. Now the more pragmatic questions. The Korean Christians are always asking me, how can I help to help North Koreans? Are you sometimes working with them to get funding, to use them as a volunteer? Because these are the super rich, the Christians yeah. that, uh, who want you to buy me diamond ring. <laughs> yes. Well, yes, there are, uh, Katie, uh, excellent question. And thank you for your very kind words uh, uh, to me personally. Uh, yes, I mean, there are some wonderful individuals and uh, even a, one church in, uh, on the other side of the Han River that has been very gracious and uh, consistent in helping. Uh, but to be very truthful, uh, generally speaking, uh, the, the Korean churches and Korean Christians in general uh, have not been as forthcoming in assistance as one might expect, since they know, in a way, more than most people do, certainly in other countries, about how bad things are in North Korea. I, I honestly think that in many ways that some of the political, uh, uh, political attitudes and naturally a kind of uh, uh, distrust of North Korea and uh, makes it difficult for many, even South Korean Christians, to kind of make that step to separate uh, their political feelings or even their contempt for the North Korean regime and, and uh, determine that they would like to help the victims of that regime. There seems to be a step that is, makes it very difficult for them to make. Uh, quite honestly, uh, over the last quarter of a century, it's really been the Europeans that uh, have stepped forward. This is most unexpected for us, uh, but uh, not entirely the case. As I told you, there are some wonderful exceptions here in South Korea and, the, and some help in, in the U.S. too. Uh, some recently that have been extremely helpful, and I'm deeply grateful to them. Uh, but... Uh, I, I feel that uh, for some reason there is a kind of uh, barrier that many South Korean Christians feel uh, about really wanting to help. Uh, 
I mean, if I can simplify it and oversimplify it a little bit, some Koreans say, well, why do we want to feed our enemy to make them stronger to, <laughs> to come? And, you know, so uh, it's a, a little bit of a mystery to me in a way, but we keep inviting our Korean Christian friends to come to find out more and see if there might be ways. So there are some wonderful exceptions to that, but I, uh, I just, uh, that is, uh, it's a work in progress, Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Katie and Tim, Mr. Martin. Uh, how's that mic doing, sir? If it is still not working, may I suggest that you type up your question in the question and- There we go. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Uh, get it working my IQ here. Uh, Tim, I wonder, thank you for the presentation. Uh, what, what kind of help uh, comes from the government in South Korea to, uh, to Korea, uh, North Korean refugees and how long does that sustain? Uh, you mean to our organization uh, directly, uh, Mike? Uh, no, sir, to them individually. I mean, can they apply for, well, like, like, uh, like people coming in from Mexico into Texas, you know, get assistance. What kind of assistance comes to them uh, in kind or uh, financial? You mean to North Korean uh, who are resettling, is that right? In, in yes, sir. South Korea? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, uh, uh, for, by the way, Michael, uh, I, I just want to thank you. Michael uh, lives in South Korea, and he does. Um, he has become an affiliate of of Helping Hands Korea down in Pyeongtaek to uh, package vegetable seeds that we smuggle into North Korea. So I know Michael, and I appreciate his uh, his determination to continue helping. Uh, I would, I'm not an expert on that, uh, Mike, but I would say that uh, uh, certainly when uh, North Koreans come in as resettlers, uh, essentially, you know, they're inheriting, they're taking on their South Korean citizenship. So they are given a, uh, a transitional amount of funding. They're given free, uh, free housing and they get a stipend for a period of time, but that kind of social security comes to an end, but the, the North Korean uh, resettlers are often uh, offered uh, uh, job training, uh, et cetera. And, uh, but uh, cash outlays uh, have not proven to be very successful in general. So the South Korean government some time ago, cut back on giving just direct cash outlet because uh, oftentimes the North Korean resettlers were proving to be quite, uh, you know, not quite able to handle large amounts of money. So housing, job training, and a certain amount of um, relief to get their feet on the ground and get moving, but uh, eventually they have to be self-supporting. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, Mike. Yes, sir, it does. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Tim, uh, next we're going to Timothy Cho in the UK. Timothy Cho is a North Korean escapee. Um, he lives in the UK and he works with the old party parliamentary group on North Korea. He works very closely with the uh, Lord. David Alton, right. actually, uh, Timothy wishes to thank you, Tim, for giving a voice to the voiceless North Korean people for the great work you've been doing. Um, uh, Timothy um, also knows, of course, that North Korea has very deep Christian roots. The capital city of Pyongyang was once known as the Jerusalem of the East. Uh, uh, Timothy's grandparents were Christians and they were from North Korea. Do you think that Christianity will be one of the prospects for the future of North Korea? Are Christianity and a different future for North Korea intertwined? Uh, okay, uh, I would definitely say, uh, in, and by the way, I uh, thank uh, Timothy for his, uh, his kind words. 
And uh, please ask uh, Tim to convey my best regards to uh, Lord David Alton. I greatly enjoyed and appreciated being able to give a testimony before the all party parliamentary group. So that was, uh, that's, that's wonderful. I frankly feel quite uh, optimistic that Christianity does have a future in North Korea. Uh, and if for no other reason than one of the early church fathers, uh, Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And uh, I've always felt that that was almost uh, kind of mathematically axiomatic in a way. If there is blood of the martyrs, of which there has been a great amount spilled in, in North Korea, that that will result in growth of the church, whether it's immediate or eventual, I'm not sure. But I definitely think that there is a future, uh, hopefully as soon as possible, post Kim family, uh, North Korea. Uh, but uh, I think the roots are deep. And the fact that the Christians have suffered so severely, and yet many of them have endured uh, such uh, a remarkable uh, amount of, of persecution, etc. I honestly believe, and, and, and I'm not sure Timothy would agree with me, but I think that the North Korean Christians will have a great deal to teach those of us from more comfortable countries and backgrounds that have never uh, experienced persecution, I believe that they're going to be in a position of teaching and demonstrating to us maybe what we have yet to go through. And uh, for that reason, I, I believe that they will play, in fact, a very outsized uh, role in, in the future. And uh, that's, that's just an impression that I have. I feel very hopeful about it, that it, uh, eventually, uh, there will be uh, a, a very strong uh, influence in, north, in the northern part of this peninsula from, from Christianity. Again. Tim and Tim, thank you. Um, next, uh, our good friend, uh, Mr. Nam Shinu, would like to convey you his best regards, also the best regards of Professor Moon. His question is, what is the current situation in South Korea? Uh, what about North Korean human rights? Uh, what about South Korea's relations with China, with the CCP? Any thoughts on that particular issue? Yes. Well, my very uh, kind regards to Mr. Nam, a uh, wonderful friend for many, many, many years, and, uh, you know, a member of the North Korean human rights and rescue uh, uh, community. So it's great to hear and I so appreciate him being here. Uh, I would say it's, uh, I know that Shinu has, uh, uh, Shin has his own strong feelings on this subject. Uh, but I would say that we're, we're in a very, very complicated and difficult period of time uh, right now. Um, it, it, this is not the heyday of North Korean human rights in South Korea at the moment. Um, it uh, uh, just as a little bit of evidence, uh, uh, two, North Korean, uh, ref, two North Korean refugees who were interned in China awaiting you know, detention and eventual repatriation were recently released to uh, uh, actually to the men, uh, Chinese men who had purchased them uh, through human traffic brokers. Uh, this is very dismaying in a way that, uh, the, that the powers that be here in South Korea did not uh, intervene, did not uh, at least request to our knowledge that they would be sent to South Korea as has often been the case in uh, previous administrations here in the South. So. It's, um, it's a little perplexing. Uh, once again, we have a head of state here in South Korea who is a human rights lawyer by profession. Uh, 
uh, I am at a loss for words how one of the greatest uh, human rights disasters that is sitting in the backyard here of, of, uh, on the Korean Peninsula uh, does not elicit a strong and uh, ethical and, and extremely heartfelt uh, protest about how the people, 23 million North Koreans you know, are being treated by their government, uh, particularly the fact that, that uh, again, the, the individual's profession is a human rights lawyer. So it is, uh, I don't feel uh, free to go on uh, at great length about this subject, but uh, I do, I worry, I, I, uh, I think I share that concern with a great number of other people uh, that uh, hopefully, things, uh, perhaps the situation may change in the not too distant future. And uh, the basic institutional concerns about rights, human rights, etc., cetera, will, will be restored uh, and uh, flourish once again in South Korea. That's my, that's my ardent hope. Thank you, Tim. Before we proceed with the final two questions, and those come from my colleagues at HRNK, Timothy Cho, UK Timothy Cho, the North Korean escapee, would like to share this with all of us. He's a Christian and he said his first prayer while he was detained at Shanghai International Prison. What a story, wow. Timothy. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. My colleague, Jun Kim, um, would like to ask, uh, in your experience, Tim, uh, what are the greatest difficulties North Korean escapees face once they leave North Korea? Well, it's a good question. And uh, depending on how much information that they have before they leave, uh, I would say that uh, in, in the case of women, for example, I would say that the greatest difficulty uh, um, that they face is the fact that they, the chances are tragically good that they would fall prey to some type of human trafficking uh, ring or individual, et cetera, uh, in, in China. I think that is probably the greatest uh, danger that, uh, that the North Korean uh, female escapee experiences. After all, she has no documents, so therefore she cannot appeal to any type of, uh, you know, law enforcement whatsoever, uh, or legal system, if you want to call it that, in China. So uh, naturally that, uh, for a woman, I believe that that would be the greatest vulnerability that, that uh, an escapee would, would face. Uh, for others, uh, it is obviously, again, as we've talked about right now in, with the uh, pandemic, uh, where random health checks are being carried out at all times. And uh, if someone is unable to respond to the health inspector in proper Chinese, et cetera, uh, the possibility of being reported to the Chinese authorities and then being detained and then eventually forcibly repatriated to North Korea would certainly rank as also a, a tremendously serious uh, problem uh, that all of them fear and lose sleep over. Uh, and, and even those that have been there for many years, uh, even if they've uh, perhaps uh, through an arranged marriage, in some cases, there's some amicable a relationship and domestic relationship on, on a rare occasion. Nevertheless, over a period of years, that constant fear that they could be arrested at any point and then dragged away and uh, eventually forcibly repatriated is probably the dominant fear and uh, dread of all uh, North Koreans, whether male or female. Some so serious that they carry um, a razor blade 
or, or some poison uh, to take or to slit their wrist in the event that uh, they would be captured and uh, sent back to North Korea. So that indication is, uh, uh, I think, uh, a real measure of how gravely serious that fear would be. I hope that answers the question in, in a meaningful way. Thank you, Tim. And one final question from our colleague, Damien Lee Reddy in South Africa. Um, Tim, you have told us a lot about uh, the, the oppression of Christians in North Korea. Uh, what about other faiths? What about people of faiths other than Christianity? Do they face the same level of oppression and suppression? I, uh, I have to say that uh, I, in some ways I have to plead ignorance about that to a large degree. Uh, the COI does mention that, uh, that you know, some Buddhist uh, groups have uh, also experienced difficulty. I mean, I, I suppose in a way any faith, any religious faith that varies or departs from you know, the Juche ideology would certainly be considered uh, a threat to the regime maybe because the Christian community is relatively large compared to uh, Buddhists and you know, other indigenous religions, uh, we don't seem to hear so much about them. I frankly have never met uh, or come in contact through our network of a, persecu a persecuted Buddhist, perhaps that they, uh, they do exist, but I frankly have, have not come across them. And uh, if we were to, naturally, we would offer them the same assistance and uh, help and logistical support as we would a Christian as well. But quite truthfully, I just haven't had uh, real experience with that. So I'm sorry to have to plead some ignorance about it. Tim, perhaps as a brief concluding remark, uh, Michael Martin is asking, uh, could you comment on the extent of the coronavirus in North Korea and its impact on life in North Korea and how badly it may have exacerbated an already trying life? Yes, um, as I think we have all seen or, you know, the North Korean uh, government continues to more or less uh, deny that the COVID-19 has uh, been a problem and uh, more or less indicated that they're like every other area that is problematic, that they don't, they're not really suffering from it, etc. But uh, other reports that I have come across in uh, from individuals inside North Korea, including from the Christian community, uh, definitely uh, it has had a big impact. And information that we received, I mean, it was difficult to, to confirm by satellite imagery. And Greg, thank you so much for working with your team to try to determine some of the locations that we thought we could see. But quite reliable reports were coming in to us that uh, one of the ways the government was dealing with the COVID-19 was simply to gather people together into these kind of camps and uh, giving them 30 days to kind of get over it. And during that time, uh, indications were that virtually no food or medicine was being provided. In other words, just uh, putting them out into uh, areas away from the, uh, the population centers. And uh, if they survived 30 days, uh, then they were allowed to go back into, into, their, into society, into their villages and things like that. So it's an obviously very draconian response, which is probably not surprising in North Korea, uh, how they're dealing with it. <clears throat> Obviously, we know that there is not a great investment in the public in terms of public health, etc. So uh, 
the little that we've heard is very disturbing. Uh, I would like to say to Mike, uh, it's, it's disturbing. Uh, it's only making the situation more complicated and difficult uh, for the average individual because now, you know, the border has been closed for almost a year. That means very little trading that's affected the Jiangmadang, the marketing. So people are really having to tighten their belts yet again. And I think that uh, this is just one more burden that they're having to carry on their backs. And uh, one can only wonder how, how many burdens can they carry uh, with, uh, you know, without reaching uh, a point where they just can't do it anymore. So uh, I don't know, but uh, the help from the government seems to be very little and few and far between in terms of really caring for the public health of its citizens. Tim, thank you very much. Before uh, concluding, uh, our friend Mr. Nam Shinu wanted to clarify that when he said Mr. Moon, he meant Moon Guk Han from South Korea, who's sending you his regards. Um, a great suggestion from somebody who appears as, uh, as Screen Global. Tim, you're a very busy man. But when you get a chance, and if you get a chance, could you please share with us a list of readings for those who would like to learn more? about the status of Christians in North Korea. We could share this with all participants who are part of this meeting today. With your permission, we could also post that on our website, HRNK's website under resources, or perhaps a list of books, articles, videos that, that people may access, those who would like to learn more about Christianity and the oppression of Christianity in North Korea. Before concluding, let me remind our distinguished participants that our next event will be uh, a week from now on Thursday, the 8th of April, 6 p.m. on the East Coast, 6 p.m. Eastern, an event focused on human rights as a priority in North Korea policy, featuring Dr. Sandra Fahey of Sophia University in Japan, and uh, Professor Lee Song Yoon, the Korea Chair at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, Tufts University. That said, Tim, what a wonderful, wonderful way to uh, to spend uh, this meaningful time uh, with you on um, on Holy Thursday. Have a Thank blessed you. rest of Holy Week. I will call you on Sunday to wish you Happy Easter. Uh, Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Greg, and I wish everyone. Uh, a blessed Passover, happy Easter, and happy spring holiday to everyone. And thank you all very much for your time, attention, and excellent questions. And uh, uh, Greg, it's been an honor to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.